Hi everyone! Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. This week we have our very special week of our virtual Dark Sky Caravan, where we will be celebrating the dark skies that we have here up in northern Minnesota. Uh, my name is Jessica Harrington. I am the Planetarium Director. And uh, with me tonight is one familiar face and one maybe not so familiar face. Um, but I will let Eli introduce himself first real quick. Uh, hi, I'm Eli. I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. And our special guest tonight uh, is Cynthia Lott, who was with uh, Starry Skies Lake Superior. And she's going to be talking with us tonight all about um, this pesky thing called light pollution and how we can preserve the dark skies that we do have here. Um, and real quick, before I turn it over to her, if you do have any questions throughout, leave them down in the comments. Eli is going to be looking through those and will let us know when we do get any questions. Uh, and with that, I am going to turn it on over to Cynthia. Thanks, Jessica. Here, I'm going to share my screen. I have a little presentation here. Okay. So here's a beautiful night sky of, uh, from just here north of here in Duluth, a little bit of Milky Way action. Um, so first of all, I want to do a land acknowledgement that Starry Skies Lake Superior has the honor of working with people on the ancestral and contemporary lands of Anishinaabe, Creek, Dakota, Menominee, Métis, and other traditional cultures around the shores of Gitche-Gummi. We engage in reestablishing living in harmony with all our relations. So here we have it, light pollution. So well, let me back up. I am a volunteer with uh, Starry Skies Lake Superior IDA. Um, we started a chapter here four or five years ago to celebrate the night skies, share information about how to reduce light pollution, um, help people who are trying to change lights, be they individuals or municipalities, different projects, what have you. And um, at the towards the end of the presentation, well, after the talking about light pollution, um, we have some exciting news about some dark sky places uh, who are that are in process of coming online here in northern Minnesota. So maybe you're familiar with a NASA satellite image of light pollution of seeing lights in, in of cities and sort of lines of, of uh, cities along freeways. This is actually um, an image of how much light pollution there actually is, where in the NASA image it can look discreet. We are looking at a whole lot of light pollution over North, uh, well, North America, over the, this part of the United States. Um, you see an interesting line kind of in the middle of the country, and that's around the 100th meridian where rainfall changes. So there are a lot fewer people west of that line, except in major city areas. So the darkest gray image, uh, the darkest gray part of the image is no light pollution, and all the colors are light pollution. So we see we are Duluth and Superior right on the edge of, of a lot of light pollution coming from the south of us, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, and then as we zoom in, you can see in the upper parts of Lake Superior, there's no light pollution at all except around small and large towns. And here we have Lake Superior. So we are very, lucky to have a place we can drive to that's almost unimpeded uh, by light pollution and uh, night skies. Um, that's, if you remember the couple of slides ago, most, most places in the country, you can't even drive to a dark sky uh, east, of, east of the Mississippi, um, except way up north in Maine. So we're lucky to have that and we're excited about maintaining that and even improving that. You can see in this slide, uh, the light pollution from Duluth and the Range Cities has merged. Um, it might not look like that if you go outside and see lots of stars. That first slide was right uh, just from in that area between Duluth and the Range Cities, but it's not super dark anymore. And so we're looking towards restoring that. So why is this important? So our human experience of night of light is really bright sunlight during the day, or sometimes not so bright here in our uh, northern region and a very dark night. That's how everybody evolved. 
You might have heard people talking about color temperature now that we have LEDs. Color temperature, correlated color temperature is trying to put a number to a light's color. And confusingly, the higher the number it is, the bluer the light. We kind of think of fire as the higher temperature it is, the warmer it is. But the higher temperature Kelvin means the bluer the light, the lower the number it is, the warmer the light. And how this is important, why this is important, is that we have, um, this is what we evolved with firelight. And this is a nice evening sky. So you can see that contrast. The warm, the warmer 10, 000, uh, 1,000 to 2,200 Kelvin of the fire in the cooler sky, the blue sky at night um, in the evening, 10,000 Kelvin. But what we've um, started to do with some of our new LED street lights is create this kind of night um, ambiance. And you can see that it's a huge amount of glare um, in the eyes and also creates a huge amount of contrast. It basically we're, it creates a daylight condition when we don't want daylight. And why do we not want daylight during the night? Well, we are um, our systems are tuned to have melatonin production at night. You've probably heard about melatonin helping you sleep. There's a whole lot of body um, processes that happen at night. And if our melatonin's not working, then those don't happen. We don't get the rest and regeneration we need in our cells. So you can be sleepy, but it can also, from not getting good sleep, but it can also lead to lots of different types of chronic disease. So how does that work? So this is kind of, a, it says a lot of information on this page. So basically light that looks white, white usually has blue in it. And blue uh, in the color spectrum isn't appropriate for light at night because blue light is our body's signal for daytime. So you can see on the far left, there's a big blue spike um, of the far left image. So this is a 4,000 Kelvin street light that was put up in Duluth a couple years ago. Um, the 4,000 Kelvin is the color temperature. It's, it's a very blue white light. And then the, the big blue spike, this, the color rendering underneath it, um, the spectrum shows what colors are making up that light. So there's a lot of blue in this light and that color blue is exactly what turns off our melatonin production at night. So it's not good to have that for humans and it's also not good to have that for the rest of the animals we live with. Um, the middle image, high pressure sodium, is, which is, is, there's still a lot of high pressure sodium lamps out there. Um, it's kind of what we've gotten used to since the 70s and 80s. It's a lot warmer light. You can see in the spectrum in the middle, the color, color rendering in the middle underneath, that there's very little blue light. Um, and that's really good for our melatonin. Now, what the thing about these lights are, they're not shielded. You can see light glaring all around. And so shielding is one thing you can do. But the color temperature is really important. Shielding and color temperature are probably the biggest things to avoid um, creating more light pollution. So the far right is amber. And amber is uh, also called wildlife friendly lighting, amber lighting. It's an LED light, so you get the cost savings from LED, but it's a very um, gold to orange light. It's similar in color looking to, to high pressure sodium, and, it, and um, it doesn't have any blue spike at all. And so that's what we're recommending for general lighting at night. And there'll be a few more images about that coming up. Any questions so far? Hand raising, anything? No? Nope, okay. not as far as I can see. Thanks, Eli. So besides humans, all, um, all of the other animals on the earth <laughs> evolved with natural darkness as well. So you think about insects, trees, actually this is, this is really interesting. This image uh, on the right, trees resting at night. The image, um, the blue looking foliage, this was a study done, um, I believe, in Finland by a university in, in, um, in Vienna. And they did um, infrared photography, like scans. And at night, they saw that the trees drooped and we might stay relaxed. But they definitely had a different um, posture and a different um, they were doing something different at night than during the day. And so 
what happens, even trees, when you light them up at night, they don't, they don't think it's nighttime and they don't get their regeneration. Um, and um, it can actually delay and, and throw off their reproductive cycles, just like turtles, owls, bats, wolves, all of that stuff. We're on a major, well, a bunch of major flyways uh, for migration. So it's really important to not have too much light at night for birds to migrate. They actually migrate by the stars. So here's a slide about wildlife friendly lighting. You see turtles orient towards blue white light of starlight reflected on the ocean. So if they come out and see the lighting on the left side, they're gonna go towards that light. It's brighter than the ocean. This is a pool at a condo building um, on the shore in, um, in Florida. This same place relamped to amber lighting on the right. It doesn't actually, it's a little bit redder orange than it actually looks through the pictures, but it's, it's more of an orange light. And what they found is they had no sea turtle disorientations when they relamped to orange light around the sh along the shore. Um, and so Florida Fish and Wildlife is now recommending this color for all wildlife, not just turtles. And um, there have been many studies that have come out that this is the least disruptive color also for humans. And traffic studies have come out that if we have this kind of lighting at night, it's not less safe than the super bright white that we have coming in now with a lot of LEDs. So that's really good to hear. Another reason you don't need to have, sometimes people think brighter lights are safer. Well, this, this light is not shielded and it's very bright. And what you don't see is the person standing there until you shield the light. So there's a lot of reasons to take care of glare at night, to shield lights at night, and as well as to make sure that color temperatures are warmer. So we have, a, these are recommendations we have, pointing lights down, warming them up and shielding them. Um, again, pointing the lights down is a really good idea. Anything that points over the horizon, the light will shine up and scatter through the atmosphere. And that's one of the things also they've found with this blue white lighting. It, it's um, the blue wavelength is physicists know blue wavelength doesn't travel as far in the atmosphere. That's why the sunlight, sun, sunrises and sets, sunsets often look red and orange. But what they found with this light, it actually scatters with moisture much further. So um, a sky glow from an LED, a bright white LED can actually travel much further than an orange red glow of uh, sodium vapor lamps, or I'm um, sorry, high pressure sodium lamps or amber lighting. So there's a lot of reasons to warm up the lights and to shield them, point them down. Uh, there's a movie we had um, partners of ours made about a year and a half ago called City Lights Starry Nights. It's a documentary about ending light pollution. Um, there's some really specific things about Duluth in it, but there's really great information about things I've touched on, about melatonin, about human health, about um, color temperature in this in the film, and that's streaming on online on YouTube. We will um, post a link to it below. Oh, great. Um, Eli, if you can do that for us real quick. I was actually already on it, yep. Awesome. You guys are awesome. Um, strangely enough, I, I, um, I, and I think it's because I'm used to more discussion <laughs> when, we are, um, when we're out and about um, presenting in person, but um, this is kind of the end of what I had for light pollution right now. Um, should I just go on and, and mention about the dark sky places that are uh, in process? Um, yeah, go ahead. And we'll just say again that if anyone has any questions, please leave them down in the comments while we have our uh, guest expert here who can answer all your questions if you're curious about light pollution or what you can do to help minimize it, any sort of things like that. Okay, so I'm going to actually flip to another screen sharing now.
Okay. So now I'll flip back to the other screen here. Dun, 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 dun. Screen. So um, I was just a short film introducing this. So I'm going to go back to this slide of looking at Lake Superior. So you can see, um, again, the blue light coming up from, from the south, the, the blue color showing light that's coming up from the south. Um, just north of Duluth and west of Thunder Bay, we have this area along the border that's pretty dark. That's Superior National Forest where the Boundary Waters Canoe Air Wilderness is part of that. Quetico Provincial Park. Over here we have Voyagers National Park. Um, and along this border here is La Verandry. Pigeon River is right here at the, at the border at the, where Pigeon River comes out to Lake Superior. So these four, one, two, three, that's five. Actually, Pigeon River is the fifth one. Um, these five um, public lands are all in process of applying to the International Dark Sky Association, and that's for a chapter of that, the IDA. They're in the process of applying to the IDA for different dark sky place status. So the four parks will be applying for dark sky park status. And the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness will be applying for um, a dark sky sanctuary status. And so that's a, that's a notch up in darkness, which is really cool. Okay, here you can see La Verandry goes along the, basically from Quetico along the border to here is La Verandry and then Pigeon River is right here at the border. The BWCAW is in a few, few Boundary Waters in a few different places. And then this medium green around Crane Lake, between Crane Lake and International Falls, that's Voyagers National Park. So um, we're anticipating that these parks, these um, public lands will re receive dark sky certification sometime coming up soon. They're all in different places of applying. Um, when the final applications are accepted, then there'll be different, I think there's a couple different board meetings that'll have to happen from the IDA to see if they qualify for dark sky status. But um, they've been working on this for a couple of years now, and it's a very exciting thing that we're bringing, uh, that they're bringing to us. So to get back to a little more kind of lighting physics, we've been doing some dark sky or uh, night sky monitoring to prepare for this and to, for, um, to help with the application process. So this is a kind of uh, technical, um, slide. These are images from software from a sky quality camera. This is a highly calibrated um, hemispherical lens that shoots upwards and basically it takes the entire sky in one shot. And what you see around, what you see around the rim of the shot is the horizon. So that's the one on the left. This is trees. They're mostly trees. There's a little building here. And then on the right, you can see even the white pines, you can see the shape here on the one on the right. So these are from three different areas. Uh, one of massive light pollution in Rammstein, Germany. Um, this green color, this is the darkest color. So the scale on the right, that white is the brightest and the purple and the black is the darkest unimpeded by light pollution. Um, so you can see the, the, the image from Germany, it's very, it, the darkest area is green in the middle. This, this kind of yellow section right through here, that's the Milky Way actually. Um, but all of, the, all of the rest of the colors are light pollution. Um, here in the center one is Duluth, Minnesota, uh, just north of Duluth and Gneeson Township. Um, green on this image is one of the brighter colors. So the, the darkest, the darkest sky in, near Rammstein, Germany, is one of the brighter pieces of sky here in Duluth. Um, it gets brighter below that, this red color right here in the middle of the spectrum. This is light pollution from as far away as, well, as near as Duluth Superior. And then, oh, I think I have something Sorry. I thought I closed the video. That's always nice. It was exciting. Um, so here in the, in the, in the center image in, in Gneeson Township, um, there's light pollution from Duluth, Superior, Hermantown, two harbors. 
Um, Brainerd, you can see some light on the uh, light on the um, horizon from Brainerd, um, which is it's kind of interesting. People ask, well, how far does light pollution travel? And it actually travels up to two or three hundred miles. And if you think of how light, how far light travels, we see lights from stars. They're very very bright stars, but they're much, much further away. So in this center image, this light blue again in the middle, that's the Milky Way. But then well, on the right hand side, this is the, this is the dark skies that you could see on the map that I was mentioning. This is up in Voyagers National Park. Um, this is a nearly unimpeded sky, almost no light pollution. There's this little, on the right side, there's this little greenish light. That's actually from uh, International Falls and um, Fort Francis. Uh, this is images from Kettle Falls, which is like, I think about 40 miles west of International Falls and Fort Francis. As towns go, they're not very big and they're not very bright, but even though those lights, people were there were shocked that you can actually see light pollution in Kettle Falls. People thought that was pretty much pristine no light pollution, but you can now see light pollution there from those towns. But this is this is what a great non-polluted sky looks like. Dark purple, the, star, the Milky Way is very bright because the stars are very bright. And raise your virtual hand if you have seen your shadow from starlight. I have, it's pretty amazing. So we have the possibility of that in some parts of Minnesota and it would be great to get back to that um, in other parts of Minnesota, even near Duluth. So here's a, a close up of that image from Kettle Falls Overlook. Again, this is the Fort Francis uh, International Falls area, 53 kilometers away. And again, this is the, um, the Milky Way across the middle. So amazingly, that, that's the slides I have. Jessica, do you have any questions or do you have any um, uh, things you want to hear more about or? Um, so I'm trying to think. I know, or at least I, I thought, was it Grand Marais in the process of getting a certification? Or are they, they just? They might be. Um, if, if they are, we're not, we don't know, I mean, we don't know everything about, <laughs> about everybody working in our area. We actually are working with different municipalities and different organizations all the way around Lake Superior. So in um, three states, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and, and the province of Ontario. Um, Brian Hansel has been very active there for years in, um, in uh, mitigating light pollution. I wouldn't be surprised if if someone's interested or if they might be in process doing it. Um, that's, as a chapter, we don't, we don't really, we're not part of that process. It goes to the, the main, the international office, which is in Tucson, Arizona. So um, it's a pretty rigorous process to go through and it's easier for, it's much easier for a smaller town than for a bigger city, even a, I mean, like a city like, um, you know, Chicago, New York, LA it would be, super difficult to do just because of the rigorousness of it. Duluth would be trickier, Grand Marais would be um, relatively much easier to do it. Um, but I haven't heard directly that that's happening. That would be great if it was. Um, so actually uh, speaking of Grand Marais and its uh, surrounding areas, we just got a question um, from Wendy Lane asking, um, what about resorts uh, along the Gunflint Trail? Um, are they trying to go dark sky too? We haven't heard of any resource, but one of the things that this is prompting um, is the, 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 all these places getting certification. Um, this is prompting the idea of creating a dark sky collective, um, which would be a kind of a loose organization to bring people from all different kinds of organizations together. One of the things that this certification does is have the lights that are in the public lands or parks um, be of a certain quality and, and, you know, minimize light pollution and brightness and be shielded and all that kind of thing. One of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't do anything beyond the borders of the public lands. So that mm -hmm. becomes uh, the public responsibility to protect, um, those places. Um, there's nothing, there's no rules there. There aren't any, 
Uh, there aren't any ramifications from the certification for outside of the boundaries. So in different places, there have been dark sky collectives that have started to assist in these public lands and these, these certified places in keeping, keeping dark and, um, and also improving, improving night sky views and sleep in the urban areas. So we're looking forward to um, seeing how we can put something like that together in this area. And that's definitely one of the reasons like we started this a few years ago was to bring awareness to how dark of skies we do have here, yeah. how accessible they are to us and why we want to preserve them. Because I mean, we can easily travel I mean, just up to the end of the Gunflint Trail and you reach those super dark skies that most people really won't get a chance to see skies that dark without traveling, as Cynthia told us, a pretty decent distance. We're incredibly lucky here, and we want to make sure that we preserve that. Right, and one of the, one of the big deals about um, Boundary Waters applying for sanctuary status is most sanctuaries that exist are far away from people, of course, because people are great at producing light at night. Um, but they're, they're usually pretty remote and often very difficult or very, uh, very difficult to get to. Um, you can actually drive to some of the darkest places in the Boundary Waters. Kettle Falls is not one of them. You have to take a boat there. But um, Crane Lake um, is, well, it's, I was going to say it's very dark, but last time I was at Crane Lake, there was actually, there's actually kind of a little settlement of people who live on the lakes, lake there, right at the end of the road. And there were street lights. They put up street lights, like bright white LED street lights. <laughs> what are you doing? This is like the brightest place that you can drive to easily. Um, and there's street lights there. But um, people will get it. We figured this is gonna this is gonna be a big kind of trickle down. Well, actually, hopefully it'll work better than trickle down. This is gonna be kind of a long term change. Um, people for a long time have thought, you know, the better. The brighter the lights are, the safer we're going to be. The brighter the lights are, the more happy people will be. The more modern we'll be, you know, it's all this kind of thing. And we're realizing, um, for one thing, um, it's happening here, but it's happening, uh, as you see in this slide in Germany, the insect populations in, uh, in Europe are crashing uh, precipitously. And one of the things people might say, oh, great, not as many mosquitoes or something, but insects are what pollinate most of our food. <laughs> so. Um, it's it's really interesting you think about turning out a light or shielding a light and it gets all of a sudden we're into human chronic disease how our food crops and food security is maintained um it's a pretty interesting you pull one little string and it's all connected mm -hmm. yeah and to, to speak more towards the gunflint trail when we've gone up there um the i feel like that's one of the more easily accessible places to people in this area too. And that the end of the Gunflint Trail is a level one dark sky. Am I right on that, Cynthia? I, be I believe so, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that, that's the darkest you'll get um, for you know quite some area around us. So, um, right. you, you know, even if they're not, well, I guess we don't know if they're going for certifications, they still are um, that level one dark sky. And it, it's pretty amazing. I was, I, I was actually just up um, near the Gunflint last weekend and I could see the the Milky Way from the porch of a, of the place that I was staying at. And it was surrounded by other places. Like there's still lights around, but just how little stuff is around. I can see the Milky Way faint outline of it, which you don't get to see. Well, and we've heard from plenty of people who said 30 years ago, they could see the Milky Way in Duluth. They could see the Northern Lights down wow. in Park Point. And that's all changed really quite recently. And now the reason we're, we're being so vocal about it is um, with LEDs, it could be a, disaster well, in a lot of places it already has been a precipitously uh, massive amount of light pollution increase mm -hmm. um, the technology we thought was going to be really great because it, the, the lighting fixtures are flat and um, instead of being curved lenses and all this kind of stuff it's like oh great they won't be up in the sky and you know be losing using less energy and all this kind of stuff well if not um, designed correctly, they're actually adding to a lot more light pollution. So we're glad that there's really easy things we can do. We can shield them. It's the warmer LEDs are coming more and more online. Duluth um, has now, um, in the last couple of years, just since I think a year and a half ago, 
has um, dedicated that they will go to 2,700 Kelvin uh, on streetlights instead of 4,000. I think they, they still are going to use 4,000 on interchanges because the information hasn't quite trickled down through standards that 4,000 Kelvin is not safer than warmer lighting. Um, and actually, it can contribute to more glare, which is, which is much more disruptive to, to driving and drivers. So um, that's all really good news. There are, um, we've just been in connection with IDA. I've, I've had a couple conversations actually just in the last week with the, with the main office. And they are bringing different kinds of certification online. So, so um, resorts, getting back to resort question, Resorts, um, there should be some kind of, and we're finding out more about this, I don't think it's rolled out yet, um, uh, a certification, a self-assessment that you can go through and once you um, implemented those things in your own home or your own business, then you can um, proclaim that you have, uh, that you're a dark sky friendly, I believe it's a dark sky friendly oh. um process so that we're really looking forward to that because people always want to know what they can do with their own house or their own neighborhood mm -hmm. awesome. their own speaking of if anyone watching does have those questions um, of what they could do or maybe how they could help to support these dark sky preservations or support starry skies like superior uh what should they do right maybe i'll go back to our slide so um, I haven't talked about light trespass. Um, light trespass is the idea that um, if you're shining a light and it's going beyond your property boundary, it's not you trespassing, but your light is trespassing. So if you can stand, I mean, you know, there are lots and lots of lights from street lights and neighborhood garages and sometimes front porch lights, like these examples down here. It's like if you have a light shining out a pack light, a garage light, that kind of thing. Or if you have it pointed down, but it's not shielded, if it's shining up and out and shining on somebody else's house, that's called light trespass. Um, there is a, we have it in the ordinance in the city of Duluth to minimize light trespass. Um, that uh, it's in being enforced with the people that are getting Commercial places are supposed to get permits when they upgrade their lighting. They, not everybody does that. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can you can put lights in to um, that'll make a, a the light pollution worse in your area and not better. Um, and there are also very simple fixes for it. Again, people find this really interesting. This glare at night. If you think about we have an opportunity of having night vision, our night vision enacted here. And like, if, especially if you're an astronomer, if you have a telescope, you know how important that is. You probably have a red flashlight. You don't have any bright white light with you or bright light at all when you're out there trying to do some observing. But if you have an unshielded light like this, the glare, um, yeah, you won't be able to see what's around you. Um, and what we're, what we're experiencing now in most of America is most people will never have never even experienced their night vision. They don't know how little light they need to see at night. And that's one of the issues too about overlighting that's happening. Awesome. Well, um, again, if you do have any questions, um, please put them in the comments. While um, we give it a minute to see if any other questions come in, I do also, um, want to say that if you are interested in learning more or are interested in supporting Starry Skies, you can head over to their website, which is linked in the comments, where there is um, lots of information there, as well as a way to um, donate to the organization or uh, become a member of the organization to help out. And I know that everyone would appreciate uh, um, supporting our dark skies, or at least we here at the planetarium love supporting our dark skies. So um, speaking of dark skies in the planetarium, um, I know things have gone kind of wonky with all this COVID thing and everything else, but um, how is, uh, there have been plans at UMD for, um, for putting an observatory again? Any news on that, Jessica? Uh, we do not have any news on that. Um, 
everything with that has kind of stalled as everything else has with the pandemic. Um, but we are, we're working to try. We're trying. <laughs> right, right. I've probably asked Jessica that question 50 to 80 times in the last year. Um, or at least once a day, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. Any news today? Yep. It's one of the first things I do when I wake up is I text Jessica asking about the observatory. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But while we don't have the observatory, we do have the um, all sky camera that has been put into place up at Chickwalk. Yeah, I actually oh, that, just had the opportunity to see that last week when I was up there. Yeah, um, and so we are going to, we are partnering with Chickwalk to run this um, all sky camera, which takes, you know, videos and images of the full dark night sky so that we can see what's going on there. And we're going to be working with them to put together some programming, stream some views, all sorts of things like that. Um, it's still in the works. Uh, I was hoping to have it all ready for this week, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but that is going to be something exciting so that we can at least still share some of those really dark, beautiful skies that we have up there. Um, so where is that, where is that located? Uh, Chickwalk is at the end of the Gunflint. Right, oh, Eli? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. um, like at the end of the Gunflint, there's like a fork and it's one of the forks. Right, um, right, right. Okay, that, that rings a bell now. I'm like, I was thinking about it like, it sounds familiar. I'm not quite sure what it is. Well, that's super exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's actually one of the things they've been um, thinking about doing for the dark sky monitoring, the sky quality cameras. Um, the National Park Service has a, um, uh, a division that does um, night uh, night sky monitoring, and they've been thinking, they've been working on how to get cameras in place. Right now, they have it's a really complicated system. It's pretty cool. It's a robotic arm that goes around and makes I think forty some different images, and it's tiled together, very high um, high fidelity imagery and very um, uh, extremely calibrated. Um, the system that we have developed by Andre Mohart and I'm sorry, I'm flipping through, but I'll get back to this image from Slovenia is a, is a simplified version of that, but it's also a, a calibrated. Um, um, setup that is specifically and only only for doing the monitoring so that's that's pretty cool but yeah having something like that in place that you could um not just see and observe but then put through some kind of uh logarithm would be really cool yeah and i know the idea is to take those kind of videos every night so that we can see kind of what's happened. If there's any aurora that happens, we'll be able to watch it through that, which I am personally super excited for. I still have yet to see the aurora myself. been here two years. Um, it is on my bucket list. I'm going to make sure it happens. Well, we're kind um, of in a lull right now. We, we are, yeah. When is it? That's a solar cycle thing. Does that pick up again? Yeah, over the next few years, it should be picking up. Cool. Um, so as long as I can stay director of the planetarium, I will be here and hopefully get to see it once it gets more active. Um, but I know one of the other things we're doing is we're getting a, a second one to put up in Duluth so that we can specifically compare and show how those dark skies really do make a difference compared to like in the city here in Duluth. Well, it'd be really fun. It would be fun to go up there and do, um, do one of these uh, sky quality images. We'd have one to compare to Duluth. We have a we have a bunch of imagery that we've done. We've done some around Lake already. It has to be in a certain um, period of time, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. It has to be in full night, which is after civil twilight, as, uh, nautical twilight, and astronomical twilight. Um, and then the moon also has to be at least ten degrees below the horizon. Right. So we have a nice window of time to do it during the new moon, around the new moon days. Um, but in the summer, like uh, up north, they don't have any full night in June. Um, even just that, even just an hour and a half north of us, I would imagine. Grand really? Yep. Yeah. Um, there's a really, well, let me see if I can, here, maybe I'll stop screen sharing for a minute. Here, let me try to do this. Oh, yeah. Um... There is an app called um, uh, Sundial, 
Oh, cool. And it tells you all kinds of the altitude of the sun and the moon. And then also, oops, also the length, the length of, that they're t of the time that they're up. And then it also gives you the, the, the different twilight ranges right here. So right now we have about four and a half hours of, well, with the moon, we have a, with the sun, we have about four and a half hours of night. Of course, this moon's sneaking in there a little bit right here. So it's a pretty, it's a really cool app. That's really awesome. Was it called Sundial? It's called Sundial and let me see the icon. The icon looks like this. Okay. okay. Cool. But I'm really happy. They actually, there's a lot of information you can get for free, but the altitude and azimuth, you have to pay a couple bucks for getting that. But, um, but it's, I was using three different apps to go out to check when we were doing our monitoring, if everything was, was aligned and everything was all lined up. And I love that the numbers are here and then it's so visual. And yeah, that's really you, awesome. Also, if you pay for it, you can change the location. It doesn't just do where you are. And then you can go, you can go forward and backward in time. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. It's, it's a super, super cool. It's like, yeah, it's a total, yeah, geek out. Um, <laughs> I like it. I'm going to have to add that one. Sundial. Okay. Yep. Going to be adding that one. Yep. I already got it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions come in, um, but thank you so much yeah. for being here and sharing with us. Um, once again, if you do uh, want to learn more or want to support Starry Skies Lake Superior, head on over to their website, which is linked in the comments. And um, yeah, this has been amazing and a great kickoff to our virtual dark sky caravan. Truly. Well, thanks for having us, Jessica. And thanks, Eli, for all the support. And you guys have a great week. We'll be tuning in. Awesome. So um, for... The rest, or no, you can head out if you need to. I was just going to wrap up the stream. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, we will be doing shows all week at 7. Uh, we're going to have lots of different fun things we're talking about. Um, tomorrow we are going to be telling you all about kind of a beginner's guide to telescopes. Um, because one of the ways that we can use our super dark skies is to grab a telescope and go check out some awesome stuff. So we're going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then later on in the week, we're also going to give you kind of a beginner's guide to astrophotography. So taking your own awesome night sky pictures. Lindsay is going to be doing that for us. Um, and then we have a couple of other special guests joining us later in the week. Bob King is going to be with us on Thursday. And on Wednesday, we're going into those opposite. Um, but on Wednesday, Jim Rock is going to be joining us, giving us his indigenous perspective on all of this. Um, so with that, we will wrap up our show. Um, check back in, though, at about 8.30 because if these clouds have moved out of the way, I will be up doing a stream through our telescope. So you can take a look at some things through our telescopes. Um, and we will hopefully get that going for you in about 45 minutes. Um, once I can get wrapped up and head up to the school and get everything set up. And if those clouds have moved out of the way, we'll see. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Cynthia, for being here. Uh, and so we yeah. hope to see everyone again throughout the week. So uh, with that, we will sign off. So enjoy bye. the surprise. <laughs>